And now, please welcome to the stage the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, Oksana Markarova, for a conversation with FP's national security and intelligence reporter, Amy McKinnon, on women and war. It is my pleasure to be joined by Ambassador Makarova, the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, who many of you will have seen on your TV screens giving speeches at the State of the Union. Um, I feel like you haven't had a wink of sleep for the past, the past year and a half. It's impossible to go without sleep, so I, I'm trying to find it. I learned it very early after February 24th, that as much as you want to work all the time and, and do what you can do, but you also have to sleep sometimes. Yes, well, echoing uh, the wise words from Ashley Judd about the importance of taking care of yourself. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ambassador, there's a lot to cover, and we have, we have 15 minutes, so I'll, I'll get right to it. I mean, we were talking backstage, and you, obviously the war in Ukraine has, has devastated the entire population. No Ukrainian, both in Ukraine and abroad, has been untouched by these horrors. But, but we do know that the way women experience war, the kind of risks to women and, and, their, um, and their needs are affected by war is, is different and is distinct. Can you give us a rundown of, of some of the ways in which this war has, has impacted Ukraine's women? Well, first of all, although you do not see sometimes the war on your TV every day, and sometimes it creates an illusion that something is different, that it's somehow sorted out, that uh, we are beyond the worst, but we are not. It's a full-fledged war for the past 600 and almost 610 days. And everyone is affected everywhere in Ukraine. So whether it's on the territories which were occupied by the Russians or are occupied now, it's all the horrors and war crimes, very brutal from uh, torturing, raping, uh, not only women, people in general, but women in particular, uh, but also, you know, um, shooting civilians, destroying the uh, hospitals and, and schools, uh, constant bombardment like we have now in Kherson or in some other even liberated areas, mm -hmm. or, or constant shelling on the, on the uncontrolled territories. Also, uh, people who live on the territories in the western Ukraine, for example, in the west of Ukraine, it's a little bit safer, mm -hmm. it seems so, but there are constant threats from the missiles. And when you have to wake up three times during the night and you wake up your kids and go to the basement in order to spend you know, uh, this time there, uh, you can imagine how prepared or not prepared they are for the school day next day. And you can only put them to school if your school has a shelter. And we're trying desperately with the help of, the, uh, of all of our friends and allies to get built or repaired or added the bomb shelters in every school, but we don't have it everywhere. Not to mention that all of our kids are be behind in their vaccination schedules. I, I mean, the normal life, as we all know, something that we as good parents think we should do, we simply cannot do. Mm -hmm. Now, 12 million people are internally or externally displaced people in Ukraine. 12 million. The majority of those 6 million which are outside of Ukraine are women with children. Uh, yes, they fled to safety. Yes, we, they were embraced by our friends and partners to be guests and have work permits, but they are not home, and they are separated from their family members. Yeah. That's, that's a trauma in itself. So from any way you look at it, whether it's a physical and direct danger, whether it's constant rapes, uh, whether it's constant uh, torturing or just lack of access to water, food, uh, or military threat, or a, a huge psychological trauma mm -hmm. of living in the war during the past uh, 610 days, in addition to actually being uh, attacked by Russia for the past nine years. Mm -hmm. That all creates immense stress, especially on women, mm -hmm. who in addition to sometimes being more vulnerable, also have to take care of the family, especially when men are drafted into the army. We actually have a lot of women who volunteered mm -hmm. But of course, you know, more men go to the uh, active combat than women. Uh, and, and so it's up to women. In some villages, we have women doing the job. And actually, that's the, another side of this horrible story, is that Ukrainian women during the 610 days have been doing so many 
things that were considered even in Ukraine where we do have uh, you know, respect for women's rights, uh, but doing everything essentially and becoming and taking on a leadership role and responsibilities that they never thought they would do before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you touched on a lot there, which, which I want to unpack, but um, staying on the topic of, of sexual violence, which I know has been just so widespread, um, the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict has described it as part of Russia's military strategy, that there are soldiers going into the battlefield equipped with Viagra. Does the Ukrainian government have data? Do you have numbers on how many women have been affected by this? Well, th this is a big focus of our prosecutor general. He even created for the first time a special unit on this uh, within the prosecutor general office because it's so widespread, unfortunately. And as you said, it's not some rogue unit or bad people. It's a tactic. They're using uh, sexual violence as a weapon in this war. So uh, we have the number of registered cases. Of course, we understand it's just the tip of the iceberg. We will only know when all Ukraine is liberated. That's why as we, you know, even when I talk about humanitarian needs, I always say we need weapons because the faster we liberate our people, the faster we will know the scale of the damage. Uh, but um, the prosecutors, investigators, all are working 24-7. Uh, they are reviewing the cases. We have a big engagement from the State Department and civil society on actually interviewing people, providing the, the support, but also doing it in a ways that we are not re-traumatizing. So uh, there are already more, more than a couple of hundreds of cases, but again, it's just, uh, you know, tip of the iceberg. So unfortunately, it's a huge, much bigger number. And many, many areas remain under occupation and we don't have a full picture yet of what's Exactly, or, or they are uh, abducted to Russia. Mm -hmm. We have a big, big number of our citizens, unfortunately, abducted to Russia, something for, for which even President uh, Putin has already an indictment as a war criminal uh, for uh, abducting our children into Russia, but it's not only children. Mm -hmm. Ukraine has, has received um, significant quantities of humanitarian aid, of military aid from, from partners in, in Europe, the United States and beyond. Um, what specific needs does Ukraine need from the international community to support its women? You touched on some things in your, in your, in your first comment about things like bomb shelters, vaccinations for children. That feels like something that the international community could, could help with. I think this war in Ukraine also is changing the way we provide aid. On the one hand, it's a full-fledged war. On the other hand, it's very unique from other countries because the Ukrainian government uh, never ceased to operate throughout all 610 days. I mean, of course, uh, in the areas where Russians occupied and where they were specifically targeting the mayors and the government officials and judges and, uh, and, and there was no mercy to any of them, you know, they specifically wanted to target the Ukrainian officials. But at the rest of the territory, or as soon as we liberate territories, the Ukrainian government works. And actually, Ukrainian civil society, during the first couple of months of this war, when international organizations left Ukraine, when, I mean, again, rightfully so, it was a full-fledged war, but we were not left with nothing. It was a network of the civil society organizations plus government, which was actually supported by the US especially, by USAID, by European Union. So it kind of sends, it's a, it's a great example of how the aid always should be used to create the local capacity. How everything that the USAID and State Department and European partners have been putting together into this either anti-corruption or women's rights protection or education for entrepreneurs. But when the war started, none of them left. They all actually reprofiled themselves and started doing what they can do in order to help. So with regard to aid, what do we need? We need everything, unfortunately, as I said, in healthcare, in education, in, 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 in uh, all areas there are needs. Mm -hmm. At the same time, these needs are very specific and Ukraine driven. So for example, Ukraine is still one of the top producers of food. So we still have, you know, we, we still have uh, tons, millions of tons of grain and, and everything else that we want to export and that's why Russia is attacking all of that to create hunger somewhere. At the same time, you cannot eat sunflower oil and, and uh, barley and, and wheat, right? You need to eat the hot food. So, so it's really finding the needs of where we need it. But 
uh, judging on uh, what we we also want to get our people back. So as as we get more air defense from the partners, as we create the safe spaces in Ukraine with with the bomb shelters, uh, people want to come back. So it also goes down to five needs that our uh, people who are outside of Ukraine, but also based on the World Bank's damage assessment report that we have identified that we desperately need in order to sustain life and in order to continue being self-sustainable. It's demining. Ukraine is one of the most mined country in the world. So the unexploded ordnance and mines are everywhere. It's the bomb shelters, so it's the critical infrastructure. Uh, and, and, and we do have a very good assessment and working with the partners. It's, of course, the healthcare and the education, so whatever help can be provided there, from laptops uh, to do it uh, uh, in the distance to, to teachers, to doctors, you know, so to, to specific needs, for example, you know, nobody, when, when we think, but, you know, the, the people who have diabetes, people who need uh, constant help because they, um, because they need to go on dialysis. How do you do it when you're in a war zone? When it's, you know, but, but your life depends on it. You don't get it for a couple of days, and it's a life and death situation. So the, the needs, unfortunately, are huge. The, the good side of that is that we do have the capacity of working together with international organizations, our partners, to actually help them to, to fine-tune what are the needs and where to deliver to, to create there. And, 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 of course, jobs creation. So whatever help especially to women entrepreneurs. They're the ones who are raising children and baking bread and doing everything in order to sustain life in their villages and their cities. And they're the ones who are helping the front line as well. Mm -hmm. I think you've, you've done a, an excellent job of really illuminating how when you take you know, the horror of the war, but then you start to slice down, okay, how does this affect women? How does this affect parents? How does this affect people on dialysis, diabetics, that the the situation just gets worse and worse and more complicated and, and, and more bleak, frankly. Um, you know, to take another slice of that, um, I was reading this morning that of Ukraine's elderly population, people over 65, that two thirds of them are women. Um, what are the needs of, of this particular group and, and has that been recognized by Ukraine's international aid partners? Well, first of all, um, you know, it's, it's really a big portion of our uh, 65 plus population. We women live longer, that's a fact. It's, it's true in Ukraine too. Uh, it's, um, it's of course a different, more uh, greater healthcare needs. Mm -hmm. Also a lot of, a lot of uh, people who are in, in their 70s and 80s, their mobility is not uh, the, the way you know, people who are younger. So, for example, one of the greatest uh, horrors on the uncontrolled territories when invasion was happening very quickly is that we were not able to take all the, all the people with us. You know, when people were fleeing and people who are constantly in bed or they need wheelchairs or, and you literally have to run through the forest with your kids, you know, uh, sometimes it was almost impossible to take. We, we had exactly the same, by the way, in 2014. Mm -hmm. So for, for these elderly women, especially in rural areas, uh, there is... A huge challenge, you know. My, my mom is is in Ukraine. We literally were able. I mean, I live in Bucha, so unfortunately, a very famous place now everywhere. But uh, for for all the horrible reasons, but my husband was literally able to take her out from from the place for hours before Russians uh, took Bucha and Vorzel, and and then all the horror started. Now, not not everyone was able to do that, and we still had we had family remaining under occupation there and helping each other and trying to survive. But, you know, the, the needs of elderly women, and I think this is, the, this is the most untapped resource. When we talk about, uh, as the former Minister of Finance, I can tell you, you know, engaging women in, in economy is, is always good. Mm -hmm. But women who retired, I think, is the most untapped resource in any country. They have the knowledge, they have the patience, uh, unless we misbehave, of course. Uh, they, they, they care, uh, they, they grow. In Ukraine, of course, we also have, you know, our families live very close together, multi-generations, so grandmothers always are at the center of, uh, 
you know, trying to tell us how we have to raise our children, you know. But, but it's, it's such an important element of us being Ukrainian, being who we are. So actually putting this part of Ukrainian society under threat is not just difficult for them. It actually puts at risk our cultural way of raising kids and how we do it. So, so yes, it's it's much bigger challenge. And then again, you know, you, you, we, we started talking with the sexual violence. And unfortunately, a massive number of sexual violence cases are against uh, these elderly women. I mean, it's it's just, in, in, in general, it's difficult to understand these war crimes, I mean, for, for normal people. But like, who should you be to, to sexually assault, you know, 80-year-old uh, woman who, it, it's just beyond understanding. So they, they, this is a very vulnerable and very valuable part of our society that actually gives us not only pain to see how they're suffering, but a need to address their needs specifically. Also, you know, you remember when the Kahovka Dam was destroyed by Russians, again, an environmental crime which turned into humanitarian disaster. When this water rushed down uh, south, and so many villages got underwater. Again, think about the elderly who could not move, you know, and sometimes water was raising, uh, you know, a couple of meters within a day. So it's, it's really a specific group who not only need our, but we owe them to provide our assistance. I've been to Ukraine a number of times and I've definitely seen the, the strength and the resilience and the incredible uh, character of of, um, of that generation of Ukrainian women. Oh, absolutely. They lived, you know, like my mother, she was born right after the World War II, uh, to a mother who was single mother as so many after the, the not single mother, but w widow already. And there were four girls in the family and they worked so hard. Uh, and their mothers worked so hard and there is nothing else they knew, you know, just constant work, struggle and fight. And unless, unlike uh, you know, our brothers and sisters in Europe, where you see this elderly who are happily traveling together, you know, enjoying their um, life at that stage, you know, in, a, in addition to hardships through all of their life, they got war at the end of their life, yeah. uh, which is so unfair. Um, you mentioned that there's now a lot of women serving in, in the Ukraine, Ukrainian armed forces. Um, that wasn't the case, at least officially, when Russia first invaded in 2014. Women were not allowed to serve in, in combat positions. Um, that changed with new legislation that was passed a few years ago. But I understand that the challenges, at least up until uh, the invasion last February, the challenges remained with things like discrimination, harassment, just simple things like getting uniform, which is is tailored to, to women's bodies. Um, what's the situation now, like now for, for women in armed forces? Well, first of all, we started working on it early on. Mm -hmm. So when I became, when I joined the Ministry of Finance in 2015, one of my key projects was the gender-oriented budgeting, mm -hmm. which sounds very boring, but actually it's a very useful thing. And in Ukraine, only Ukraine after Sweden in Europe fully implemented this approach into our budgeting process. So you take into account the needs of both genders. Mm. Uh, so it's not, you know, favoring one or another, but it actually you have to take into account the special needs and you need to have uh, separate restrooms uh, in boxing classes instead of assuming that it's only boys who are gonna go there if you really want girls to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, and vice versa, you know. So we, there was a lot of progress since 2015 that we had in those issues also including in the army. So it wasn't just this last legislation that we took during the war, which lifted all uh, limitations. So Ukrainian armed forces, I think are one of a very few armed forces globally that have no limitations whatsoever for women. So women right now are allowed to serve anywhere in the armed forces, do whatever they, they are ready and capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we do have about 15% of uh, women in the armed forces right now, which is one of the highest uh, percentages uh, globally. Now, of course, uh, in order to be able to not only put it on paper, but really support it, you need to take it into account. You need to have a uniform. Uniform is not the biggest problem, let me tell you. The armor yeah. to put on yourself, unless it's specifically designed for women, not only that it's heavy to start with, but it's not very comfortable uh, in all the areas, if it's uh, uh, to, to, to wear. But 
we are actually moving ahead very quickly in that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's something that our uh, Commander-in-Chief and the Minister of Defense uh, are putting special focus on. Uh, when we hear um, about any cases of discrimination or harassment, uh, first of all, we are discussing them very publicly and they are not tolerated. And believe me, I have so many sisters who serve in the armed forces. Uh, I don't think uh, it's very easy. Uh, it's, it, will, it will become uh, very easy for whoever even would want to harass them at some point to do that. But, but again, we're taking these very issues very seriously. It's, it's, women do have separate needs, even when you are in the trenches and in the combat. And they have to be addressed if you want women to be a full members of this. And we see a future in that. Right now in Washington, there is one very brave woman, Andriana Susak, mm -hmm. who, who went to serve in 2014 and 15. She was a veteran already when this war started. She rejoined the armed forces. Uh, she got hit by the anti-tank mine uh, was lying and the majority of doctors told her that she will never walk. Well, she's walking right now in, in on the hill and trying to advocate for what, all the weapons. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just remarkable. And I think, you know, the future success of, of Ukraine depends on the participation of women in every sphere of life. And I'm so happy that this vision is now shared by the majority of people. Not by all, we still have a long way to go. And there are still, unfortunately, a lot of self-restrictions that we women put on ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in, in Ukraine, of course, everywhere, but especially in Ukraine. We always assume it's, it's our job to raise children, it's our job to... Uh, but, but we also are very self-critical in general. So there is still a lot, lot to work on, but we are very proud of all the women that serve now on the front lines. Well, I think that was a, a wonderful snapshot of just one way of, of the incredible um, progress that Ukraine has made um, in reforms and over the past uh, over the past decade. And so, after a, a grim but necessary conversation, maybe we should leave it on that that optimistic note uh, about Ukraine's future. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.